Hey, what's going on? This is the Saturday Down South podcast. I am Connor O'Gara. Will, you are back. NCAA mm-hmm. tournament brackets are out. Life is good. How are we doing? I'm doing great, man. Um, I'm really excited. Like you, you know, told the audience, I um, kind of got pulled uh, to a shoot last week on Thursday, and we uh, have added NWSL coverage uh, to our network Ion. So that's super cool. If you guys ever want some uh, NWSL, I know we have uh, some teams in our SC markets. Um, so it's been really cool to just uh, you know dip my feet in sports television, which is not really something I've done before. Um, yeah, it's been a been a really cool little period here. Selection Sunday, to your point, was one of the most kind of uh, not tumultuous, but dramatic, I guess. It, it wasn't sad. It wasn't like the college football playoff selection committee, which was sad. It was just, uh, it was dramatic. I don't know how to better say it. Be honest. When your boy Robbie Avila of Indiana State got left out of the NCAA tournament, you shed a tear. You did. That's okay. Just a little. And that part of it was sad, right? But, you know, when you have all these bid stealers, you know, you start to see, you know, who your conference is, you know, stuff like that starts to matter. So, yeah, as much as, you know, we can infinitely expand, it's, it's, it's a great example of college football expansion, right? It's like this happens to be a year where there are definitely some teams left out. Now, we've also seen some years where there were 15 10 teams that made the tournament they got smashed in the first round so this just happens to be one of those years that no we don't really need 90 teams but there are some definitely left on the cutting room floor but will that doesn't fit my narrative and i can't bring up that point unless it actually works in a specific year no you're Mm -hmm. exactly right it did did feel bad for for some of those teams by the way great ncaa tournament coverage that we have on saturdaydownsouth.com tons and tons of stuff that we are cranking out not just even within the sec but really national, I feel like I've written like three national stories in the last 24 hours related to the NCAA tournament. We've had a lot of stuff, uh, so you should check that out. If you are looking to pass the time before things kick off on Thursday, I promise we're not ignoring college basketball. But like I said a few weeks ago, we're football all year round on these airwaves. That's what we're talking today. We do have a totally subjective ranking coming up here in just a minute. So I do think that does kind of tap into the NCAA tournament. Um bracket season if you will it's not quite a bracket we're not doing that mm-hmm. um but but a ranking nonetheless we also have my guy trevor sikama of pff joining us in a bit to talk some sec prospects in the nfl draft plus we're going to end with jersey contest and lad of the week but first will i you know i thought about the way that we could do this with ranking defensive coordinators in the sec and i thought you know what we can't do a draft for everything we're gonna have a lot of these drafts i love that our oc draft was kind of the first of this. We're going to be doing that the first Thursday of every month is going to be draft Thursday for us. So I thought, you know what, maybe we could do it that way with defensive coordinators, but let's not, let's not, because it's really that, that top tier elite group. And then I think there's a whole lot of subjectiveness beyond that. It's a little bit different than ranking SEC coaches or something like that. I think it's a little bit tougher to define. So I thought, you know what, let's just do it this way. Let's rank the top five SEC defensive coordinators and not try and do like a one through 16 because that would have just made me pull my hair out. And I, I don't have time for that to be hundred percent honest with you. Not that point yeah, in my life. Yeah. And like we talked about it, we're totally aligned, you know, drafting offensive coordinators is number one, more fun, but it number is. two, ob- objectively easier, right? Because you can see the offenses, you can see the measurements, things like that. You can see what's working and what's not with defense. I mean, you know, you could take a guy, uh, even like a Ray Lewis, right? And say, okay, what's going on in this modern defense? And it would be hard for him to say, well, this is this guy's responsibility. This is what they're trying to do in this play. And and again, that guy's a football genius, but the way that defense evolves and the way that defense changes system to system is more of what I'm talking about. You know, if you get Tom Brady on a broadcast, he can say, okay, I can tell you what this quarterback is thinking. I can tell you what he sees in this offense just based on, you know, the perspective. But defense is a lot more like, you know, you never want to be that guy who you see someone running wide open downfield and you point at the cornerback and you go, that was his fault because you really don't know what's being stressed. So, yeah, it's more of is this stuff working? Not necessarily, you know, can we evaluate each individual, you know? I think we know offenses a little bit more than we know defenses. Yeah. As, as consumers of the yeah. sport who didn't play a defensive position professionally, we try and bring in people that have that sort of expertise you know, mm-hmm. Bobby Carpenter or Jeff Collins, people that we just had on recently who understand that side of the ball very, very well. I, I can sit here and tell you, yeah, I feel like I have a better understanding of offensive football than defensive football for the points that you just brought up. It's just a little bit tougher to be able to break down. But obviously, we do feel like there are some who probably stand above the rest. So that's what we're going to try and identify today. So let's let's start at five with mm-hmm. one that I know that you're going to agree with. Uh, I have Kane Womack, the new Alabama defense coordinator, is my fifth best SEC defensive coordinator 
a bit of a surprise hire. And I remember when I was told that Womack was going to be the guy, I thought, okay, I actually, I actually kind of like that. And I probably like that more than most. Uh, and we probably are going to disagree on on Womack at least until the the actual game start because he's not necessarily somebody that that is coming in with the track record of recruiting four and five star talent in the South. Even though he does have those recruiting ties in the in in just the southeastern region as a whole because that's where he spent the majority of his career. But the exception and the the reason that he probably got this job was because of the time that he spent north of the Mason-Dixon at, at at Indiana. That's where he and Kalen DeBoer for, first started working together, really battling together on a daily basis in practice. And you might be thinking, all right, well, he had a defensive-minded head coach at Indiana. Tom Allen was there. Mm-hmm. Um, if it was just Tom Allen, and I say this as an Indiana grad, uh, surely Indiana would have had at least one top 100 defense the last three years after Womack left. Like, one of them. Well, they did not. I didn't realize it was that bad. It's that bad. They yeah. went They went from having a top 20 unit with Womack there in 2020, which say what you will of defenses in 2020. I would argue it was actually harder to play defenses, to play defense in 2020. The last three years, Indiana has not had a defense finish in the top 100 in scoring. That's pretty bad. That is pretty, pretty bad. Yeah, Womack- I'll say this too. Like with that coaching staff, we've joked about it's the greatest coaching staff ever, you know, if that guy was the engine behind it, he would not be uh, in the Manny Diaz defender of the dark arts position, which is Penn State's defensive coordinator and linebacker coach, right? He would be the head coach of a program somewhere. So I think, you know, and again, Tom Allen did great in Indiana, given the expectations. But to your point, it's like him being ahead of Womack didn't in itself mean that he was a smart guy, because if that was the case, he'd probably be in the NFL by now. <laughs> And now Tom Allen, ironically enough, replaces Manny Diaz as a defensive coordinator at Penn State. So exactly, yeah, all, all makes perfect sense. Everything's tied, mm-hmm. tied to one another. Uh, but Womack at South Alabama, he improved that defense by a point per game in year one, and then consecutive top thirty units running the defense that Will loves so much. The four two five, the four two five. Mm. That's what he's going to do. I do love do some four two five. I know you're going to become a Bama fan by the, okay, no, probably not so much, but you will probably have a different impression of his defenses now compared to, I think the end of year one, or maybe the end of year two. If you recall that four, two, five did pretty darn well against Oklahoma state in Stillwater, that 33 to seven drubbing of the Cowboys kind of before they had the Ollie Gordon thing figured out. So take that with a grain of salt, but still, Impressive nonetheless. That was one of the more head scratching results, probably the entire season in college football, because it's not like South Alabama turned out to be this 11 and one world beater or anything like that, but still was a good defensive team. I'm admitting Alabama's defense is going to take a step back. They're going to take a step back this year. They have a lot of questions outside of, you know, a couple of household names in Deontay Lawson and Malachi Moore. But if Womack gets a touch of patience, just a touch, and he gets to be there for the end of year two. And it's not like, hey, you need to fire this guy because it's not a Nick Saban-led defense. I think he can end up being an exceptional hire. So I'm not saying that he's the best defensive coordinator in the SEC, but I figured that'd be a good place to start someone that is doing this job in the SEC for the first time. Yeah. And, you know, my thing about Ken Womack and, and the Alabama hires at large is I think they're great coaches. It, it just is about the recruiting part of it. But what he gives me is Dave Aranda vibes, another guy who – you know, learn from uh, Gary Patterson style defense, another four two five guy. Yep. Um, just a guy who flat like was not a recruiter, but we see that at Baylor right now. We see that he is a great defensive mind who is not a recruiter, and so I think that you know, I think he's a better DC than a uh, Pete Golding, right? And Pete Golding's a great recruiter. I think that he's you know, and and like I'm not gonna you know, get into comparing him to each individual guy, but I think as a as X's and O's guy, if you have the ship built, bringing him. Okay, and Womack's a great move because when you see what a guy can do with that level of talent against bigger teams and against like-minded talent, if you give him that talent, uh, that's kind of how you project it, right? He doesn't have the track record of like a Corey Raymond or, or somebody like that. I, yeah. I realize that, but I think you'd get a lot of pushback on saying that he's not a, that he's not capable of recruiting with the relationships he's had to establish. So now, again, it's different when you're talking about bringing in that four and five star talent, but mm-hmm. if we're talking about being able to have those relationships in the state of Alabama, in Georgia, you know, in, in Mississippi, wherever across the Southeast, like he has that. He definitely has that. And there's there's a certain respect level that King Womack came into with that job. And that was actually seen as a positive for him 
and something that he will continue to get better at. If this is so transactional in this day and age, and if he's already got that part of it figured out, I guess I'm a little bit more optimistic that he's going to be able to, you know, use that to his advantage and start to get those, you know, those big time blue chip guys that Alabama always gets, but he's not exactly coming in cold in the way that some might think just because he's been at, at South Alabama and hasn't had one of these big time jobs. Those guys that Nick Saban always got. Yes. Yes. Fair. Fair. <laughs> Perfectly fair. Because yes, Alabama's not bringing that type of talent, whatever. Uh, not that we're going go into the history of Alabama, but right before him, yeah, they had a couple of five stars, but it was not like that. that he revolutionized the great, him and Kirby Smart are the greatest crews of all time. Anyway, you're, you're right. I need to do a, great, uh, a better job of saying Alabama was always this versus Nick Saban was always this. Yeah. Yeah, those are two different things, even though obviously Saban was at Alabama for half of my lifetime and for yeah. most of my life as a as a college football fan. And he built LSU's recruiting. You know, I mean, it, yeah. it, the Les Miles just picked it up. So that, that was his thing. Anyway. OK, I thought I'd have more opposition to five. All right. We're, we're mm -hmm. in a good place. We're in a good place Four. I did not think I'd settle on this guy. I definitely did not think he'd make this list a couple of years ago or probably even at this time last year. But I think he's very worthy right now. Tim Banks of Tennessee. Mm hmm. I have become more of a Banks fan since he was hired. I really did not like the move at the time for Josh Heupel. I thought it was maybe his fifth choice as a DC at the time. There was a lot of public rejection that was going around. And I, I, I thought, you know, by the time he settled on Tim Banks, I was like, I don't know. This is a guy who's always been in that co-DC role, which mm -hmm. we talk about duties a lot. This is why we talk about duties. He wasn't calling those plays as the defense of the dark arts, Penn State defensive coordinator. That was Brent Pry, who actually has yeah. done well for himself by you know being able to parlay that into a power five head coaching job. But I guess this would be the end. I how about this. The Alabama OC coordinator under Nick Saban is like what the Penn State DC. It's the opposite of that because they get these good guys in there and then those guys move up. It all Hey, hate the credit, James Franklin. Same thing with Joe Moorhead. He has made some good hires over at Penn State. He has. He very much has. He has been as good as his hires. That's probably my bit, biggest criticism of James Franklin as a whole is that he is very yep. much as, as good as his hires. Um, but, yeah, so that, that was kind of my, critici my criticism. And I'm thinking to myself, what is this going to look like with Tim Banks at Tennessee with total autonomy on that side of the ball with a head coach that, let's be honest, is not overly concerned about playing complementary football? That, that was the knock on him when he left UCF. And UCF is talking about how, you know, players are like, hey, let's get somebody in here that actually knows how to coach complementary football. And mm -hmm. say what you will about Gus Malzahn doing that, uh, a little bit tougher. But I do think that there was a, a significant question mark about Banks's potential. And there's no way that I would have said this guy is going to get four years in Tennessee. And he has mm -hmm. earned that fourth year at Tennessee because – they were a defensive team last year. That's, they that's, sure were. And like, a running team, too, yeah. At their best, they ran the football. They played really solid defense. They could get you behind schedule. It was easy to forget that Tennessee's defense was best in the SEC in yards per rush allowed, best in the SEC in tackles for loss, finished better in scoring than Mizzou did at 22nd nationally. The only SEC team who finished better than Tennessee in yards per play was Georgia. I mean, think mm. about that. Like, they... They put up these numbers that, yeah, I'll admit sometimes, you know, I, I, I can lose sight of those impressive things in an eight and four season, uh, nine and four, if you include the bowl game. But man, they were they were no slouch on the defensive side of the ball. I mean, they, they were really, really impressive. I didn't think that we'd be reading off stats like that heading into year four for Tim Banks. I love that his group can get to the quarterback. They can get in the backfield. There might not be a better returning player in all of college football at doing just that than James Pierce Jr., who, look, I'm going to sing a lot of his praises this offseason. Get ready for it. I think mm -hmm. he's way too good to be on the all-bang-the-drum team, but just know that if he were allowed to be there, he would be because he's that kind of force rushing off the edge for him. He's got a ton of questions to answer this year outside of that. They lost some pretty key pieces. That secondary, man, it just felt like the portal kind of derailed that secondary. But if he can answer those questions, and if this is like one of the better units in the SEC this year, which is by no means a given, but if it is, I think Tim Banks is going to be one of those guys you're going to start to hear in head coaching searches. And he has done a lot of things, I think, to, to really establish himself as a respected person, a respected part of that program in more ways than he was a couple years ago. Yeah. And I mean, I've said it time and time again, but this year meant just as much, if not more to me at Tennessee 
2023, right? Then 2022 did the year they beat Bama, mm-hmm. the year they were at number five until, you know, October. But um, point being, you know, that, that, you know, finding your floor with Josh Heupel, it was always about, can you play complimentary football? When your offense is not going your way, are you going to pout or are you going to figure it out? Right. And that was always Josh Heupel's thing, you know, with, um, Dylan Gabriel, the last, you know, the post Mackenzie Milton era at UCF, it looked like, okay, well, Scott Frost and um, uh, KZ could win big games. But now we got Dylan Gabriel and we got Josh Heupel in here. And when their offense works, they're going to smoke you. But against good teams, right? We saw that with Georgia in 2022. They have no, you know, they, they don't know what to do. I think that if they had had the mentality from 2023 and the team from 2022, that team could have really competed. Now they had one and then the other, right? They because these big moments got away from them, just like it did at UCF. The ten, the South Carolina game got away from them, right? The Georgia game got away from them badly, you know. And last year, you, you probably yell at your thing. Oh, the Alabama game got away from, them. yeah, because their quarterback just forgot how to throw the football. There was not really much they could have done, giving up twenty seven straight points in a run. Hey, your defense is gassed for a reason. Your offense is not moving the ball. And so, you know, there's only so much you could expect in Bryant-Denny Stadium. So, yeah, I, I look more at the Kentucky game. I look more at the Texas A&M game. I say, you know, so, yeah, I, I think that this this Tennessee team can really show people. And it, like I said, it's it's just like uh, when we talk about Ole Miss and Tennessee being running teams. You see the flashy big passes. You see all the stuff. But Bazooka Joe was not Mr. Bazooka. We were on that from week one last year. And so the image that people had of this team, I think, was just wrong uh, because they were not doing what they tried to do. They were doing their second, third thing because their offense couldn't throw the ball the way that it did in 2022. So when that happens, you end up seeing what's our defense really made of, right? What's our, you know, because we can't score 50 points a game. We can't, you know, go into Tiger Stadium and smash LSU. We can't go, you know, beat Alabama and come back and, and come back and come back and come back because our offense is so good. So, yeah, I'm I'm really fascinated by where Tennessee goes from here because it looks like they showed, okay, here's our proof of concept of if we have talent, we can do this on offense. And then if we just change our mentality and we don't accept, we don't get scared, we can we can kind of marry those two together. And again, all that comes down to um Yamaleava, right? Have moving the ball, get staying on the field, because that was the issue with Bazooka Joe, is that until he turned into this freight train, kind of like there go to the C game, he, he couldn't, you know, move the sticks and the offense was getting off the field. So I think they found that balance in one of the stranger ways I've ever seen. Josh Heupel had changed the way that he usually coaches. He, yep. He definitely did. You can't change that style and embrace that if you have a defense that's a total liability. Now, yep. I understand that there are people that will probably say, hey, they, they got the doors beat in against Georgia. I watched that Mizzou game. They were a disaster in the second half of that one. I'd argue some of the Mizzou stuff was a little bit more of like, hey, we, we're we tired of being on the field. It's difficult. That that was a game which they couldn't play complimentary football at all. And the defense maybe wasn't as bad as what that final number indicated when things mm-hmm. just kind of got away from them. But that's maybe the tough thing and why there's uh, perhaps still a little bit of that outside skepticism is that Tennessee's big moments during the Josh Heupel era have very largely been offensive fueled. And they're, this is why you aren't elite moments have been probably more so the defensive liabilities. Having the second half that they had this past year against Bama, of course, the, yep. the South Carolina game from 2022. Like these are the moments in which you say, ah, you know what, Tennessee, you're not a complete team. This is yep. why you can't have nice things. And so they're like, if Tim Banks is able to get that signature type victory, I'm not just talking about beating AM, you know, 21 to 17, whatever that final score was, but yeah. like having that game where you beat somebody that you're not supposed to, and it's like, yo, your defense flexed. You know, you just won a game that look, you needed to have an elite defense, and you showed that you are absolutely worthy of doing those types of things. That's probably what's going to make Tim Banks more of a household name more than just, hey, the guy who's been better than probably Tennessee fans anticipated with the situation that he inherited and the situation that he walked into. Yeah, yeah, I, I totally agree. I'm, I'm like I said, like, and remember the big thing, like my first take on here looked so wrong about, you know, against the big teams, Tennessee struggles, and then we saw him play Alabama, and we saw him play Georgia in 22. And now it's, like I said, it's, it's about – this whole thing adjusting and being pragmatic. You know, we see them uh, playing Iowa as, as wild as that sounds. It was still able to keep, you know, most of their 
uh, defense bought in and say, okay, well, if this team is able to get you off the field, you might actually be in trouble. I said, no, okay, we're going to play smash mouth football. We're going to be able to do that. And, and yeah, I'm, I'm really, really, really fascinated by where this team goes. And, and furthermore, you know, when this regime was put in, you got to think about, you know, as silly as they were, right? The Pruitt sanctions, all these different things. And that was the big thing we talked about. You can get players on offense through the portal immediately. You can get a Jaden Daniels. You can get a hand in hooker, but building a defense, it's hard. you can get, if you, the more guys you get out of the portal, the harder they are to keep on the same page. Cause you got one guy from East, whatever state you got one guy from Ohio state who's disgruntled and we're not sure where his head's at. He's got the talent. What's he doing? We got one guy, you know, we got Andre, Andre Sam, you know, we have all kinds of different guys that are just put together. And that's what their defense felt like in the first couple of years under Hypo. Now it looks like they're starting to get some guys in. They're starting to flip some guys. They're starting to get people to build into this defense because it's very rare to see uh, a first like a head coach come in and just turn around the defense unless it was a atrocious defense that was misusing everyone, you know? Yeah. Tim Banks worthy to be on this list. Not sure if this is where he's peaking. If if I guess maybe if he's peaking here, that's because he got a head coaching job. Could yep. Be. Number three. Pete Kwiatkowski, Pete Kwiatkowski, who, look, I had to look up the pronunciation of this a million times because it's one of those names that I've written a lot over the years. Probably not that much, but the Texas defensive coordinator is somebody that I think is going to become a lot more familiar to SEC fans. Pete Kwiatkowski. I think mm -hmm. the K is pronounced. I looked it up so many times, Will, so many times, and sometimes I felt like I'd hear the K, and then sometimes I wouldn't. Kwiatkowski. Kwiatkowski. You're so on it with these pronunciations. Now, what's our root? Go ahead. I'll, I'll look it up. Kwiatkowski. I, I'm mm -hmm. going to go with that. Um, the, the, I know that the A is not. You don't say Kwiatkowski. That's not it. That's definitely not it. That, that's all I know. We've spent so much time with Texas talking about the offensive breakthrough, and understandably so, because the stat that I used to bring up all the time was before B. John Robinson came off the board in the first round, 2023 Texas's last first rounder on the offensive side of the ball was, was Vince Young. I mean, that's crazy to think yep. about with the incoming talent that they would get. Sark's ability to finally develop and scheme on that side of the ball is a big, big reason why the Longhorns legit preseason national title contender. It's finally warranted all those different things. But the job that Kwiatkowski, I can't say it. I can't say Kwiatkowski. Kwiatkowski. It's so it's, easy. I'm shocked. Uh, Kwiatkowski. I, I am See, struggling. My it's God. rare that we get down here in SEC country, kind of those names like that, you know, like those uh, kind of Midwestern, Owski, that type of stuff. We got some people from the Pacific Islands, but that's usually not what we're seeing. Down here. I got to work on my Polish last name pronunciation. Right. Apparently, jeez. But he has not been talked about probably a lot among SEC fans just yet. And I, Texas, I think there are a lot of people that recognize – why he got this extension that'll pay him $1.7 million in 2024. Again, we talk about a, a year four coordinator. It is a tough thing to be in that good of standing with the way that college football currently works. And that if you have three or four bad weeks at the wrong time of the year, that could be all she wrote for you. Okay. Yeah. And especially at a high pressure job like Texas, but that's a guy that has total autonomy on the defensive side of the ball with Sark, obviously locked into the offense, who yeah. has had consecutive top 30 defenses, the last of which was 15th in scoring, fifth in the country in yards per rush allowed. And maybe my favorite stat of Texas's defense last year, they were number two in the country in opponent third down conversion percentage. That's wow. good. That's really and, good. And that alignment is what that is, because third down conversion is not blown coverage. Yes, exactly right. And, and look, I, I think you know we have questions about what's it going to look like in the defensive line with Murphy, with Sweat gone, with Bo Davis off to LSU, like all those different things. But they have a lot of pieces on the back end that make you feel like, okay, Pete Kwiatkowski, I think I got it right. I think I, yeah, that was probably my best yet. Th to make you think that this should be one of the better units in the SEC. Anthony Hill Jr. is going to become a household name in the SEC real soon. They rank 38th in the country in percentage of defensive production. So coming back, that is. The knock on these defenses is that they gamble a ton, very much like a Blake Baker, who we're going to get to on this list very soon here. Last year, one of the worst 15 pass defenses in America, but also top 10 in the country in interceptions. You roll the dice. You take the good with the right. bad. That's kind of been what it is. He's going to have games where you're saying to yourself, 
oh my God, get somebody else calling plays. The floor is probably a little bit lower than one would think looking at some of those raw numbers, but the sum of the parts is still really, really good. And I think Texas is in a better place having somebody like that running that defense. You also brought in this guy, Johnny Nansen, who comes in from Arizona as their DC is kind of like a cast off from the Jed Fish era at Arizona. So there's mm -hmm. major help that they're bringing in on that side, despite the fact that they lost two of their top assistants on the defensive staff. I still think that while Texas is not at, let's say, Georgia or Alabama levels of defensive standard, they do have some major, major scrutiny that they face when they have a bad week or two because there are a lot of fans who remember the days of Chiswick, of Muschamp, of Manny Diaz, and those guys running those defenses makes it feel like, oh, my God, like why is this team hitting 14 points? There's mm -hmm. still going to be some of that, but I, I think he's still an excellent scheme. John Chavis, and say what you will about John Chavis. <laughs> I, t I told the story about how he made sure to say that uh, he had nothing in common with DJ, with DJ Durkin. I told exactly. That. that was the lead up. Say what you will about John Chavis, but he wanted to let you know he was not DJ Durkin. <laughs> John, John the Don Chavis. You're welcome yeah. to come on Chief. anytime. Yeah, it's a good old chief. Um, but yeah, I, I think that, again, a four two five guy is one of the better coordinators that we have uh, in the SEC, whether he's known or whether I can actually correctly pronounce his name. Yeah, um, an underrated staff here, an underrated guy, right? A guy that is was supposed to be um, kind of like Doug Peterson, not Doug Peterson, Chris Peterson. Um, <laughs> the, he was supposed to be a Boise State lifer, right? Played at Boise State, came over with Peterson um, when he went to Washington, was their DC over there, right? And so he actually low key has this pedigree, right? And the former Washington coach in the SEC, different era, right? Seems like he was a little bit off of that lake coaching tree and that kind of field yep. next regime that, you know, whatever, say what you will about them. But there, there were some good coaches on that staff and there was some really good talent on that staff. And a lot of that talent was still on the team whenever they made the playoff. And so, you know, what that says to me is that Texas has a very sneaky, well-built staff. Another guy I love over there is uh, Terry Joseph, right? Mickey Joseph's cousin. Uh, he's their defensive backs coach. And now he's like, he is a diet Corey Raymond. He's a guy who has mm. gotten huge recruits. You know, he's, he's the guy who's been around and, and he has uh, succeeded there. And like I said, you talk about that's, that's why I started to gears returning. Okay. Third down that's alignment. So we know about Terry Joseph. You had Bo Davis, right? One thing that you say about these great defensive minds, right? Saban, Kirby, they have these position coaches that are in lockstep with them. And it's not, you know, you can have a, a Dan Mullen or a Lane Kiffin run your offense and kind of just have some other guys around them. On defense, you know, you got to have a good DBs coach because if you're Bo Davis, you do not know how to coach DBs. You, you're just not in your scope. And so what I like, um, <laughs> you can pronounce this guy's game, bro, this guy's name, brother. Uh, what I like about our friend here at Texas. <laughs> Uh, boss, big dog over in Texas. He uh, he has been able to consistently, consistently build a great staff that all is in alignment, and that's why I'm more bullish about them joining the SEC. Because on one side, you got Steve Sarkeesian, like you said, you know he is that type of Sun style offensive guy. Whereas on defense, you do have some dogs. You got the type of recruiters. You got the type of scheme guys. And you saw it last year when you had Bo Davis developing those guys in the D-line. You had, you know, Terry Joseph with these big recruits he had in the back end. These guys he got out of the transfer portal, you know what I'm saying, to help out the defense. So, yeah, they are running – this is an insane thing to say out loud, Connor. Texas is actually running a pretty first-class organization for the first time since Mac Brown. Now, we'll see if that means they're back. But the way it's looking right now, you know, what do you look for? Success developing guys retaining guys, having alignment. All of those markers are pointing one way. Now they come up, fall on their faces, and win four games last year, next year. Well, Texas has done that before. But that's the only thing making a stop and say Texas might be back because we've seen them fall on their face before after these big years. But if you want to look at the data and the real dudes in that room, there's a lot to like. If Texas is indeed back, which, again, we said we are not going to be declaring until after this season. you got to do it in consecutive seasons. It's because their guy, PK, that's what we were going to call him from now on. Yeah. PK. Our buddy. Yeah. Our buddy. Our, our guy. It's because he did his job successfully. Yeah. Let's talk about the guy that BK just hired. Brian Kelly just hired. Yeah. Seamless transition. I got Blake Baker at number two. The new LSU defensive coordinator. I love Blake Baker. You know this. Okay. Yeah. I, have, I have banged the drum that the job that he did rebuilding that 
disaster, that dumpster fire that Steve Wilkes left at Mizzou. I just mean from a schematic standpoint, they obviously still had a lot of talent there, but they were put in some really, really tough spots that 2021 season. And then Baker steps in 2022 and instantly that, that group started to have that alignment that you talk about and you saw the wheels turning. It set the stage for them to be able to ultimately in year two as a DC there make and not only make a, a new year six bowl, but win it. Brian mm-hmm. Kelly agreed with that. That's why Brian Kelly said, you know what we're going to do, Blake Baker? We're going to make you the highest paid assistant in America. Okay. And that's two years removed from saying, mm, you know, uh, you were on the last staff that was here. I just, was, you, you just do your go off. We're not going to retain you. I uh, wish you the best of luck when he probably could have had him for a fraction of the price. Mm-hmm. But we know that Blake Baker's defenses, they are aggressive. They blitz a ton. And more often than not, his pressure packages work. They speed up the quarterback. And even if they're not fully getting home, they're doing things that make you change how you play offense. That's the goal. We dug into some of those numbers when we were talking about Harold Perkins, his potential fit in this defense, why post-snap, all that stuff with him should be way better than what it was with Matt House. Here's the only reason, Will, and you knew I was getting to this, the only reason that I don't have Blake Baker at number one on this list, which I thought long and hard about. Glenn Schumann, I think, is the only guy in the SEC that would have made you, an LSU fan, even more excited if you had got him. If you had found out, hey, yeah. Brian Kelly just poached Glenn Schumann. You would have said, national championship? Is yeah. that what we're doing? That would That is the only thing that I came back to, and I thought, if both of those guys were available on the open market, you're taking Glenn Schumann. Okay? And some of that is projecting a little bit, right? It, it, there is a little bit of that, but I kept coming back to that, and I'll, I'll, I'll say more about, uh, about Schumann in, in a second here, but I, I realize some, some might agree or disagree with that. That's fine. You could point to Baker having total autonomy at Mizzou. Glenn Schumann does not have total autonomy at Georgia because obviously, you know, he's working under Kirby Smart. It's why this this discussion is so close, in my opinion, to begin with. You could argue that Baker didn't have the talent compared to Schumann. Again, I agree with that 100%. Nobody's saying that Mizzou has as much talent as Georgia. Obviously not. But if there's a teeny, tiny, little bit of hesitation, it's the relatively small sample size and how much of Baker's accomplishments as a defensive mind are associated with this very specific group at Mizzou, a group that was totally bought in, that had alignment, a group that if you watch the NFL draft in, in a couple months here, you're going to hear a lot of those Mizzou defensive names called. They are, yep. they are going to be one of those groups that we look back and we're like, they have like five guys on the defense that got, that got drafted. Like that's, that's pretty impressive. Well, we agree that Miami makes anyone look like a shell of themselves. It's where coaches go to die. Again, we saw it with Manny Diaz. There are a couple, you know, yeah, correct. Kevin Steele looked like, anyway. Uh, Dan Enos, although. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> he <laughs> might actually, that might be, I'm familiar with your game. But there are some other guys out there, yeah, for sure. Dan Enos, uh, can't, can't blame Miami for his struggles. Uh, definitely yeah. not. It's worth noting that Manny Diaz, who has had a lot of mentions on this pod, I'm now realizing, he, he, I think, is one of the sport's better defensive minds, right? I think we could all agree that he's yeah. he's up there. He's held in that regard. That's why he got such a coveted job like Penn State defensive coordinator. And ultimately, now he's head coach at Duke. He had Baker as his DC for that 2019, 2020 seasons, those two years. But then after that group regressed by about a touchdown per game, Manny Diaz tells Blake Baker, you can stay on as DC, but play calling duties, I'm taking those over. And Blake Baker basically said, nope, because duties matter way more than title in this day and age. Yep. And that is why he ultimately bounced. It was kind of a weird time when it happened in the cycle, if I remember. I think it was like one of those like mid to late January moves that you yep. heard about. And you're like, oh, that's interesting. LSU just added a defensive coordinator for Miami. Like, okay. Um, didn't prove to mean anything for that 2021 season, but it's one of those moves. Linebacker that, play was great. That's tw- all I got to say about that, as Forrest Gump once said. True. Yeah. LSU's linebackers were good in 2021. That is correct, yeah. which you could definitely not say for most of the 2020s. But I'm splitting hairs. Okay. I, I like Blake Baker a lot. I am a believer, but that is probably baked into the reason as to why he is not number one, or I guess those are two reasons why he's not number one on this list. 
Yeah, I mean, his resume is uh, interesting in a way because he has a little bit of the um, – he has a little bit of, let me scroll up here, all new guys. Yeah. Um, he has a little bit of that, uh, Kane Womack in him where he succeeded at La Tech. You know, he succeeded at these lower levels. Um, and, and with less talent, which Mizzou, to your point, I mean, hey, developing guys is such a big deal, right? Because we've seen talented teams underperform. You know, we've seen some of those at Alabama. We've seen to a degree some at Georgia over the years. We've seen some at LSU. That's possible. But when you have a team like Mizzou that's punching above their weight class, that is just swamping Tennessee. You know, it's another rough Tennessee game I didn't talk about. Uh, but again, it was not the team, you know, so they, the, the offense just could not move the ball. The, the defense just ran out of gas. So point being like, um, yeah, I, I think that he has some elements, right, of being a good scheme guy while also being a great recruiter, right? Putting together, you know, some of that stuff. Now, is he the second best schematic coach on this list? Probably not, but being able to marry those two, you know what I'm saying? And that's why, you know, Glenn Schumann at Georgia is in such a perfect situation for him because he is like the advanced, the A pinnacle Dave Aranda, where I think he would be a good head coach because he would hire people who could recruit. But that that is a guy who is around the best or second best recruiter ever in Kirby Smart, right? Because he gets some of the credit for the Nick Saban stuff, uh, defense at least. Okay, he's around uh, for a second coach, boom, Will Muschamp. He's around um, a guy that just Dan brought T. Yeah. Oh, Dan Landing as well. Yeah, and it was the guy T, the LM's defensive coach, uh, defensive backs coach that just came over there to Georgia. Oh, wow. Well, I'm, I'm Robinson, T-Rob. Yeah, that's um, right, that's So, right. yeah, like that's another guy who's a great recruiter. So he has able to just uh, assemble these, offend- these Avengers kind of on Kirby and Georgia's dime. He's also worked with Kirby, great recruiter, great scheme guy. Talking about Schumann, right? Well, Blake Baker, it's more of a he has been the guy who has kind of orchestrated the stuff. Is he this great schematic mind? Like uh, Schumann, not as much, right? But he can do enough other things. He can go get and make these pitches to Bo Davis. He can go say, you know, he can be on the trail and start flipping guys. He can do that type of stuff. So for LSU, they, number one, have a talent problem on defense. I don't think that's a secret. They got Harold Perkins and... um... Yep. Yeah. (laughs) A a defensive backfield that they hope turns into... Because there there are guys who, at one point or another, were highly regarded in that defensive backfield, and they're trying to be able to make it work. And, you know, I've talked about this a lot. Like, I feel better about what they have on the back end this yeah. year compared to last year, but you're still going to need to do some developing. It's not like you're getting these five stars that are coming in here playing day one. And so it's not going to be drastically different from yeah. zoo in that regard in the way that some might assume. Yeah, exactly. And you know, I, I'd put it like this, right? It's like, you know, Blake Baker's talents would not be as well used at Georgia because it's so segmented. You have so many guys who are chopping it up and doing that. Whereas Schumann, his, his schematic genius would not be as effective at LSU with, you know, some random dudes out there playing D line or whatever. Like, I I think that that's, there's just completely different coaches in that way. Um, So yeah, I I'm very interested by him. I've said time and again, that I think the defense is probably going to struggle in the early year, but to that point, you know, what do we look for? What are the green flags? Let's be positive, right? Take over for Steve Wilkes, who is the worst defensive coordinator we've covered. Um, No, he's not the worst. God, and you know who's there. right there is, is when he was a head coach, Barry Odom. So, I mean, right. I mean, back to nah, back. No, nah, we, we can't dismiss Barry Odom's first first two years at Mizzou where, yeah. or not at Mizzou at uh, at Arkansas, where like I struggle with that a little bit because like they, they at least showed some signs of promise. Whereas the Steve Wilkes defense at Mizzou worse higher than drink hat. Like, right. Worst at the time, it made a lot of sense because of his NFL background and all those other things. But that group was such a train wreck, Will. Like, yep. they, they couldn't stop. They, I, I don't remember the final number of their rush defense, but it was like 280 yards between like 280 and like 310 all year. Bad. We did the weekly yeah. thing where we would look at it, be like, is Mizzou last in the country and run defense? And yeah. it just felt like it was such a liability. And so, to Baker's credit, when you step in with really similar guys, and yeah. you instantly are able to turn things around and you just look like you have a chance. I think that's the best testament of a coordinator. It's what Baker has working in its in his favor. It's why he has a chance to be able to turn things around at LSU. Yeah, and, and where I was going with that, remember I said as a head coach, Barry Odom, because that was that team turned into a weird Josh Heupel oh, amalgamation yeah, yeah. Yeah. after Pinkle left, right? Point. So yeah. when you think about what Mizzou's defensive coordinator room was, it was five years or so of – Hey, get your son to come play for Mizzou. We can't stop a nosebleed, please. And so th- then Blake Baker shows up, and you got 
boom, Barry Odom and then Steve Wilkes. I mean, talking about a downtrodden room, they've been sold a new guy. It was Steve Wilkes. He made it worse somehow. On. One, one, you're forgetting Ryan Walters though. Ryan Walters was in between, was in okay. between those groups. He, he would, it, it wasn't consecutive awful defense because of right. Walters being like kind of the, the guy in between and he stayed on, he was yeah. on Barry Odom staff and then he stayed there as yeah. well. So he was controlling that year one defense with drink. And then ultimately he goes and joins Barry. Um, not Barry, I was about to say Barry, Odom. Brett Bielema at Illinois. Oh, and then man, he gets his first head coach. Yeah. yeah. No, and all confusing. I'm saying there in terms of, you know, that's pre portal at that point, we're talking about yeah. the Barry Odom regime. So there's no, you know, those are the classes they're bringing in. Just come play for Barry Odom or then go play for this guy. Drink away TK for, he's kind of a goober, you know, how are we going to do this? And boom. So I'm talking about this. That was back in the era of five, six years of recruiting classes mattered. So what he walked into is several bad things in a row. You're right. Well, it's a fine coach, but you know, then Wilkes comes in, changes the system, changes everything. So that's all I'm saying is that, you know, when you look for those green flags, like a Kane Womack, Blake Baker has that. And he also has the stops in recruiting, which Kane Womack does not have. Yeah. He's talked to coaches and lost recruits to Alabama as soon as they get the offer. But Blake Baker was out there fighting with people with Miami. And again, Selling people the Miami Hurricanes, I don't know how they do it year in and year out, but he did it. He got some good guys in there, and he was able to kind of sell that hopium. And so if you could recruit to Miami, everybody, and, and with no success in 20 years, that's the thing. So, yeah, not not to get too, you know, in the weeds about Baker. I think I've done this for everybody. I, he is a unique guy. You know, we talk about guy from Louisiana, stuff like that, and I don't think his value to other programs would be exactly what it was to LSU, is my point, you know? You take an in-person visit to Coral Gables, Will. I don't know, man. Like, eh, that might be the easy part of the job. <laughs> It's and then like, you go to the stadium, it's 45 minutes away through traffic. Oh, no, 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 no. The, the stadium is not a part of the recruiting visit. There's no way. It's, hey, it's a PowerPoint. Hey, check out our stadium. You remember, Trust us, bro. Uh, what was it? Uh, a few years ago, it was the it was the Dear King sports. I think it was Ross Dellinger who did like a the Dear King story about what it was like when he committed to Miami or what it was like. Maybe, you know what it was? It was what it was like his first night of NIL of being mm. able to capitalize on NIL as the Miami quarterback and all of these places that he's going to and all these things that he, where he just like basically does an all nighter worth yeah. of events. And are like, okay, I, I get it. I, I get the Miami sell of why that yeah. would be, that, that would be fairly lucrative. That's the easy part of the job, the whole scheming and actually doing things in front of 58 people that show up for your games. It's a little bit tougher. Right. Yeah. And the, it's the negative recruiting too. So yeah, I, I think it's, it's some interesting guys in this list for sure. Yeah. All right. Let's, let's end it with Glenn Schumann. Um, who could forget March 15th, 1990. Uh, that was the day I that wasn't alive. So you were not. Yes. Uh, tech, I wasn't alive either. So um, you're not alone. Adam Spencer, our SDS coworker. He was born that day. My high school girlfriend was born that day and mm -hmm. Lauren, all three of them were born on March 15th, 1990. I would March. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> Okay, cool. I always say I always say I've dated two people in my life and they were born on March 15th, 1990. Yeah, weird. Very Can't very call weird. that first with a bad rep because you got close. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, I, I've got a type. I do uh, very much. Exactly two weeks later, Glenn Schumann was born. Exactly four weeks after Glenn Schumann was born, <laughs> I was born. That is useless fun information. It is also a reminder that this man is young in age, or at least I'm going to pretend that he is because... Mm -hmm. By saying somebody is four weeks older than me, it's like, oh, hey, yeah, we're totally young and uh, we're not getting up there or worried about our mid-30s at all. Um, I'm going to get the negative out of the way first with Glenn Schumann. He's had just two years as a defensive play caller. I get that. There are a whole lot of people who would kill for a safety net as good as Kirby Smart. Okay? Acknowledging that. This is not someone that's at pre-Oklahoma Brent Venables levels of D.C., this mm -hmm. is not someone who is at pre-Georgia Kirby Smart levels of D.C. We know that, okay? He's not probably going to be one of those guys that's like a D.C. at Georgia for eight or nine years. And I, I think he's going to get too many of these opportunities coming his way. But everything, everything that I have heard, everything that I have watched with my own two eyes has told me this guy is special. And Georgia mm -hmm. fans know it. Georgia fans see it. Let's remember that coming off the 2021 season, wherein Dan Lanning was the primary play caller for one of the best defenses that we've ever seen in the history of this sport. Georgia lost five players on the defensive side of the ball to the NFL draft. Wait a minute. That was just the first round. Five defensive players selected in the first round. It's insane. Yep. They lost eight defensive players. 
to that 2022 NFL draft. It is crazy to think about that type of talent walking out of your door, even at a place like Georgia. And so Georgia comes in bottom 10 in the country in returning defensive production. And, oh, you got this new defensive coordinator play caller in Glenn Schumann. What does he do in 2022? How is he going to follow this up after Dan Lanning is off to Oregon? Georgia repeats as national mm-hmm. champs with a defense that's still top five in the country nationally in scoring. And it was number one in America against the run that season. That is so unbelievably impressive, even at Georgia, where I, I get it. You still have Kirby Smart. But in 2023, we know about the 12-0 and start. It was another top five scoring defense. Not the number one rushing defense, but had the number one third down defense in America. Okay, The stat that we talk about is so valuable for alignment and for being able to understand scheme and all these different things in pressure pack situations. Georgia had that with Glenn Schumann calling plays. Against the five teams who finished in the AP Top 25, Georgia allowed an average of 15.6 points per game. So not just, oh, we're going to dominate all the bad teams and then we're going to let up 35 against the good teams. No, no, nothing like that at all. And I know it's the talent. I know it's Kirby. It's not just that. Okay, it's not. He is a master motivator. He is a master developer. He's been with Kirby since day one. He was Kirby's first hire at Georgia back in 2016. Mm -hmm. He's been with Kirby since he was a student assistant at Alabama back in 2008. This guy's yeah, they are lockstep with one another. Okay. I think the CJ Allen deal, the way that that played out last year, is a good reminder of why Glenn Schumann is so highly regarded and why this guy understands what he's doing. Last year, Jamon Dumas Johnson, he breaks his forearm in that Mizzou game. This is a guy who came in as a preseason All-American. He's having an excellent year. Maybe he's not living up to this N'Kobe Dean standard you know, at, at Georgia, whatever. He's still a very, very good, valuable player. C.J. Allen steps in as a true freshman. Got a Glenn Schumann recruited himself. Yeah. All of a sudden, we're like, who is this dude? He is awesome. Awesome. And it wasn't perfect. And he's got his moments where he still has things to figure out. And, you know, the gap discipline, all those different things that you expect a true freshman to kind of struggle with. Yeah, CJ Allen's probably still working through that. But a lot of people wondered why Dumas Johnson transferred to Kentucky and why he didn't just run it back at Georgia if he didn't want to go to the NFL draft. I don't know this for certain. Okay. So I'm not speaking out of like, hey, someone told me this. This is 100% true how it played out. But it wouldn't surprise me. If there was a conversation about what Jamon Dumas Johnson would get if he returned to Georgia, and instead of Georgia giving him that money, they said, well, we feel like C.J. Allen is he's already hes already ready to lead a defense, a championship-level yep. defense at that, so we're not going to break the bank to keep you. If you want to walk, go ahead, but you know what? We feel like we got your replacement already, and he's, he's good to go. That is trusting development, and a guy – that Schumann looked at as somebody that has that background with the linebackers. That is a guy that he looked at and said, this guy is ready. Let's roll. I trust that this guy is going to take the next step next year. So that to me is just one of these signs that for my money, he's as good as there is as a defensive coordinator in, in the sec. Any arguments with Schumann at one? No. And I do want to say this. All right. So we keep talking about like these old style of defensive coordinators, like across the country, how many of those guys are there? Cause we just kind of said, there's not really one on this list. There is not a Kirby smart, like that style of DC. How many are, are there in the country? You think PK is probably considered one of them, right? You'd have to, cause I mean, you have to factor in his time at Washington as well yeah. on, the, on that staff, but man, like, Outside of that, I'm trying to think here. You wouldn't go like Dave Aranda was that forever. He's obviously got a head coaching job, so he's no longer yeah. in that role. There are still probably a handful of those guys that are out there, like, you know, a Kevin Steele, although Kevin Steele had an alleged coup to try and get a head coaching job for the first time. So I don't know if we can truly count him in that. And he's obviously since yeah. retired, but you're right. It is kind of a dying breed of this. Like I, I want to be a a lifer coordinator um, type coach. So yeah. someone at age thirty three, obviously he's not in that position just yet to be you know part of that. Now if we're having this conversation seven eight years from now and he still is surprisingly right. in that role, that changes things. But no, the the Brent Venables of the world, they uh, they feel like they are few and far between. 
Yeah, I think there's one that just stands head and shoulders above the rest, which is uh, Phil Parker at Iowa. Oh, that's um, good. Yeah, that's the obvious one. You're right. I should I think have thought he, of that. Yeah, I think he's the last. I think he, that when I look around the country, and I'm sure someone will hit me up and tell me a guy I'm missing. But when you think about a defensive, like this is a defensive team. We have a defensive coordinator that leads us, and he's not going to go, you know, do other stuff. Because yeah, you could talk about Venables. Well, now he's a head coach, right? You like in terms of a just pure like tank defensive coordinator, the way that we see some offensive coordinators still are around the country. That's just like you bring this guy in, he's just going to change everything, um, and. If PK is that, he's number one on the list. You know what I'm saying? If he's a guy that you can keep for 10 years, is going to rebuild staffs and not go chase another job and keep opponents to 20 points a game, that, you know, because we're talking about guys that have parts of stuff. And maybe I'm thinking, what we need at PK is consistency, right? But which we've seen it over the course of his career. But in the SEC, you know, again, Texas being back fully hinges on that because I think we think Sarkeesian's kind of, you know, got it figured out on that side you're, of the ball. You're so, like, Charlie Strong felt like that for, for a bit. I think even yep. at times Elko felt like that for a bit. Elko, just, Elko was like that. Yes. Just like, when are these guys going to get jobs? You're, you're right though. in that it, it, I'm struggling to come up with them outside. Phil Parker was the one that I should have had at the top of my head, like immediately, but like fickle felt like that for maybe a minute. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. It's just, yep. it's just not as common. It's just not as common anymore. Yeah. And I mean, even, um, even uh, Marcus Freeman was that for like a little bit of a second, but it did have the longevity, right? Yeah. It was like, okay. Um, but yeah, I mean, Michigan's got this weird cross training with the Baltimore Ravens because of Jim and John Harbaugh. So you have like, you know, Jesse Minter, Wink Martindale. Don't like those two people named Wink Martindale in the world. I think they should fight and figure that out. Okay. That's not cool. Uh, and then you have Mike McDonald, who's now the head coach of the Seahawks. So like the Michigan thing is just like its own, like there's guys coming in and out and doing all that. So that they really don't have that guy either. And Ohio State, you know, uh, who's their guy uh, from Jim Oklahoma? Knowles? Jim Knowles, yeah, close, yeah. right? Not quite because there's been some moments where he really was exposed. I hate to say it that way, but that's what you do at Ohio State—you get exposed. And so, point being, like, I don't, but anyway, so point being, you know, I, I wanted, I do want to take that uh, that step to say, if we do this list in 2010, okay, if we do this list in 2013, there are a lot more of these guys around the SEC. So, as offensive minds, I feel have evolved, and as people can make more of a career on these like uh, heliocentric offensive stuff. We've seen more and more of those guys uh, like what Colin Klein's doing at, um, uh, at AM, right? Yeah. Right. Where it's like, you're going to come in and be a system. So point being taking out that style of coach, which like I said, we'll give PK another year. He's probably the closest because Schumann probably will get a head job like Baker, uh, you know, kind of same situation, probably will get a head job at some point. Um, but that being said, a guy like Schumann in that environment, and this is what's getting all the way around to a guy like Schumann in that environment is exactly what you could want. Kind of like what I said earlier. It's like he can pull the strings. He can work with Kirby. He can work and, and, and make the whole modern thing click together where it's you're balancing. I do need to get input from Coach Boom and Kirby when Coach Boom is on the staff. I do need to get input from these great position coaches, but I also, it needs to be my defense and I need to really put my stamp on it. And yeah, Kirby can when it really, really matters, Kirby can get in there and override me, but it is kind of a, okay, this is me. That's why he's still there. Cause to your point, he could have done the Dan Lanning. You know, those guys were seen as pretty much equals, but the difference is recruiting, right? So Dan Lanning, or you can put him in charge of the program and go, you can bring SEC talent. We know that. Schumann, again, he's like a Dave Aranda. It's like, uh, well, but in the spot that he's in, that's exactly what Georgia needs. Cause they do not need a recruiter to be a DC. It's, it's similar to us in Alabama. Your DC doesn't necessarily have to be a recruiter. You just need someone in the building. <laughs> It's Georgia. It's they, they still they can still recruit their pants off. I mean, Schumann yeah. is still still an excellent recruiter. Oh yeah, Muschamp was an excellent recruiter, even though you know his role, you know, kind of what what exactly was it during these last couple of years when you know you know that he's taken a back seat to Schumann. He took a back yeah. seat to, I guess, to Lanning as well. Yeah, he was there. Yeah, twenty twenty one. I think he that was when Muschamp would have still been there, but he was maybe in an analyst role. I don't know. Whatever. Um, but yeah, now you're seeing why we didn't draft these guys. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> like I, I would love to see what Glenn Schumann, I, I am very much looking forward to the day that Glenn Schumann has to do what he's doing at a place that isn't Georgia, because I think we will have an even greater appreciation for it. I exactly. And that that's the one quote unquote question with him, but that's because he's so far ahead of the curve, right? Like you said, yeah. it's like you know, Sean McVay. It's like, wow, like you've been given all this power so early um, without the mess ups that some of these like many ideas, you know, like a Blake Baker maybe didn't take exactly the right roles he needed to. And maybe that held up his career. Maybe that's why, you know, Manny was a head coach and then it took him a while to get back and had to go down. Right. Or, or Blake Baker hasn't, you know, quite had the opportunity yet. So Schumann just hasn't made that next move. So it's unfair to evaluate and 
you know, say, well, let's assume you did it wrong, you know, because you every move he's made, which has just been, hey, maybe Alabama and Georgia kind of got this whole thing figured out. I think I'll stay there. Smart so far. <laughs> keep, get, keep getting promoted, man. Keep getting promoted within it. And it's like, you know, you, you've, you've done this rise without having to necessarily go be at southeastern Louisiana and you can go yeah. and, and have, you know, these new experiences and you're still going to be put in great spots to be able to learn from some of the best in the country. And he yeah. has taken a different path than I think most have. Honorable mention on this list. Brad White just missed the cut. The Kentucky yep. defensive coordinator, he would have been on this list if that defense wasn't so disappointing last year. That's yeah. It's pretty much what this comes down to. Like that, there's no doubt like he probably would have been fourth on this list if mm-hmm. this if we're doing it this time last year, give or take. I think he would have been kind of back end of the, of the top 5. Um Pete Golding. He will be on this list and Ole Miss fans might be upset at me for not putting him on this list because that that group definitely improved this past year. Um, if Golding is able to be a part of a playoff team this year, and it's not some 2018 Oklahoma situation where it's like the number one offense in the country and the defense is like not even top 100. Yep. Then I think Imagine we're having such a situation. <laughs> anyway, uh, not bitter at all. Um, yeah. The, I, I think that there's potential for him to, to definitely rise into this, this top five, but the reason he's not, I still go back to the Bama thing where, look, you had nothing but top eight scoring offenses for a decade before your arrival. And then you were there for five years, okay? Five mm-hmm. years. And I understand Nick Saban's got his hand in the defense. I won't go full Lane Kiffin and say that Nick Saban is the defensive coordinator, although he would be able to speak to that better than I could, obviously. Yeah. But failing to have a top eight defense in those five seasons when you're there – Tough look. Bama didn't have a top eight defense last year either. So I guess it's not all on Pete Golding. I'm not saying that. But it is a little bit telling how your fan base feels when you leave and how you're viewed during that time that you're there and putting up some of those numbers. I don't think I don't think Bama fans uh were exactly sad to see Pete Golding walk out that door. They were not. Whereas Ole Miss fans, I think if he has another good year, they definitely would be. And he'd be like, oh man, like finally get somebody that that feels like has turned things around for us. Um, and he walks, but the, the questions will be on the defensive side of the ball with Ole Miss and with getting those pieces to fit in very transfer portal, heavy reliance they have on the defensive side of the ball. If he could do that and make this like a top 40, even a top 50 unit, I'll, I'll extend it out to that because it's Ole Miss. If he can do that, then I think we're probably talking about him having a true redemption arc in Oxford, as opposed to the guy that Kiffin just poached off Saban staff because Bama fans were sick of him. Yeah, I think that uh, this is something I've just thought of. I'll run it by you. I think the top, let's say, 10 defenses are a lot more predicated on who you play than they've ever been. Mm -hmm. Um, Because when you look at like a Michigan, they just don't play anybody. I'm not being mean. I just don't think their defense is that much better than from an offensive standpoint. From an offensive standpoint, I agree with you. They don't play high powered offenses week in, week out in the way that it's. Yeah, I, I think that's fair. And and furthermore, you know, when you have to score with one of those offenses, like, okay, uh, Alabama has to play LSU and Georgia and it, all of these great offenses. So those teams are going to score points, right? Unless Dallas Turner has his way. And so point being, you know, they're going to, you know, you're going to have to keep up with those teams. So the game script is going to get away from a Phil Parker, right? It's going to, you're, so... Bama's defense last year was as good at return to joyless murder ball. The only reason why it finished behind like in Michigan or whoever else is in the top 10 is because they got everyone's best shot and they're playing better offenses. You know what I'm saying? And so point being, you know, I, I think that Pete Golding, uh, I'm not going to hold him to that standard, but I am going to say that it immediately got better when he left. <laughs> and I think that, you know, you could make all these, but what I'm not going to do, and I've said this from the beginning and it's not sarcasm. I'm not going to devalue the contributions that Nick Saban has made to the sport. So if you're going to say, okay, well, I mean, if you're Pete Golden and you don't know what to do, we just saw what happens when Nick Saban calls a defense. It was the best defense he's had probably since Kirby Smart and or um, our boy Asparagus. And so point being like, uh, there, we've mentioned so many names today. I'm sorry, guys. Um, but Good yeah, like, Jeremy Pruitt, the gym teacher Jeremy he's known as. Yeah, yeah, yeah. His, yeah, so it's like, you know, and that was a little bit short of a, span anyway so it, point being like we've 
Pete Golding had Nick Saban and could go knock on his door and say, what do you see here? And we just saw that Nick Saban would tell you exactly what was up and give you a scheme. So that's always been my thing. And Bama fans thing about Pete Golding is that he is the Glenn Schumann who took the big job he wasn't ready for. He was not ready for the, and he cost Alabama, I would say, and Bama fans would say, chances at championships because their offenses were as good as they'd ever been and if they just need if they just had like 2019 lsu level of defenses with pete golding outside of the covid year which again is just a completely different animal i just i can't deal we've talked about i can't deal with people trying to argue that with me but point being if they had at least 2019 lsu level stuff where it's like okay we got david and he's a genius our our defense is hanging out in that top 20 top 30 range for most games but we know we need to lock in and stop somebody we can do it that's not what alabama had under pete golding they had a defense that was a problem and they had an offense that was great every year. And, you know, they had the talent. And they had the coordinators to win. And he was the thing stopping them. I, I'm not going to say it was Nick Saban. And so at the end of the day, like, that's what I say about Golding is that he's a good fit for an Ole Miss where you, you're about having fun. You're excited to get four and five star guys out of the portal. You got, you know, Lane Kiffin's out there making TikToks. That's great for you, right? But we've seen what happens with you when you're at the biggest stage. And it wasn't great, you know? The thing with Golding, too, is his physical appearance was never going to do him any favors. I'm being a hundred percent honest. Like it just, there, there is a certain bias that, that comes with that to where when things are going well, it's because of the greatest coach of all time, when things are not going well, it's going to be because of that short guy on the sideline. That's somehow running our defense. That that's, that's how it's always going to be spun. And I'm not saying that that's entirely fair to Pete Golding. And there's something to be said for that. There was a lot of talk about Bama players having this, like this confusion with play calls and, and the way that yeah. hurry up offenses would operate or no huddle offenses would operate and how they couldn't get the play calls coming. In. I think it was Terrell Lewis who said that at the draft a few years ago, about that was such a struggle that they dealt with and they just couldn't get the play calls in. And they felt like they were always on their heels. And you'd see these, these guys like a Dylan Moses who are like, why isn't this guy just a heat seeking missile? Why does he look like he's on his toes the entire time? much like we talked about last year with Harold Perkins and like yeah. some of the spots that he's put in. And so there was a little bit of that that went around certainly with Pete Golding. But yeah, I mean, look, he's on honorable mention and he's not, yeah. I'm not yeah. sitting here clowning on a guy saying like he's one of the worst defensive coordinators in the SEC. I think last year felt like a prove it type year. This year, I would argue with even more pressure, probably even more of a prove it year for Pete Golding. Yeah. And like I would say um, Pete Golding, you know, I can't really – say anything about his appearance because he is fundamentally kind of a chubby Cajun from Hammond, Louisiana. So who among us, right? I can't, I can't <laughs> say anything about that guy. Um, I would like you to approach that, uh, the Kane Womack hiring with the same thing, because that guy looks like one of my buddies. Uh, so if we want to get into that, we can, but the thing about Pete Golding wasn't even exactly one of his experience. It wasn't exactly of his appearance. It was more about his professionalism. It was that he kind of just looked like a party guy. He looked like Rob Ryan is a better example, but without the, uh, without the stuff behind him. So, and I think that when Nick Saban is known as this buttoned up professional guy and you got Pete Golding, you know, kind of looking like he's a little bit of a goofball. I think that's more of what it's about. Whereas, like I said, at Ole Miss, you can be a goofball and Kiffin's a goofball. You know, these are two Saban guys that were both kind of, uh, okay. You were, we were always kind of mad. Like he went, Saban went straight from being mad at Kiffin to being mad at Pete Golding. Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it just transferred. Rob Ryan didn't have the whole my dad is Buddy Ryan thing as well. Probably. Uh, yeah, that helped him a lot. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. All Almost right. Just like son of bum. Seriously. Uh uh, Wade Phillips. Anyway. Yeah. Oh, what a Wade Phillips, what a legend. That would be that'd be yeah. a great guest to have on the show one day. Uh maybe we'll be able to do that. All right. Uh let's kick it to Trevor Sikama. Great discussion on all things Brock Bowers, Jaden Daniels, this loaded group of SEC receiver prospects, and much more. So here's Trevor. Now excited to be joined by a very special guest. It is PFF's Trevor Sikama. Uh, the three-round mock, it, it is live. It is up. I've always wondered but never asked. As much as everyone kind of clowns the whole mock world, and it's you know it's a part of the business, the business that you uh, have so much passion for, It's it sounds like such a difficult thing to put together because of how many different things can change it, a trade here or there, and how much that can throw everything off. How long does it take you to put together a three-round mock? Uh, so I was working on this uh, Sunday and, and, you know, there's many hours that you're just like thinking about it before you kind of like get to the, get to the, uh, the Google doc anyways. But I think this one took me about seven hours to do. And, and that is like from the beginning of like, I'm working through the PFF mock draft simulator, I'm doing the three rounder and then, you know, you got to format it and everything. And then you write the blurbs for a lot of these guys. But a big chunk of that is the actual mock draft process. And going through 
the free agency moves, the updated depth charts, the updated um, team needs and everything. And you just kind of take a lot of stuff into account. This time of year is a lot of fun to do mocks because you do, you, you have basically everything that you would want. You've got the film, you got the combine testing, you've got free agency now in the rear view mirror for the most part. And you get to really hone in on what you think these teams are going to do in uh, on draft weekend. So um, I'm not somebody who hates mock drafts. I know that there are some draft analysts that really love the, evaluation part of it so like they love the building the scouting reports and all those kinds of things but sometimes you talk to people and i get it there's a lot of like backlash that happens with mock drafts and everything so they don't love doing it i love doing them they're a lot of fun for me uh i do a lot of them on my free time anyways just to get the juices flowing because i'll have an idea of a team moving up or something like that so um even though it is kind of like a longer process to to take one of those from ideas and, and the mock draft itself into the print version of it, if you will, the online print version of it. Uh, I do really enjoy the whole thing. So these are a lot of fun for me. One, one of the things that I, I'm sure you like you talk about a lot and is something that I have to remind myself is there's a difference between saying a player is going to this spot and saying how you feel about a specific prospect. And the number one guy that I've had to remind myself of that is the Brock Bowers thing. Mm-hmm. The entire pre-draft season, it's it's felt like, man, this guy that I, I assumed was a lock to be a top six, top seven pick, he is being mocked very much like, hey, if he's not going to the Chargers, it's probably not going to be a top 10 thing. You have him going 15 to the Colts. Uh, I know he's been pretty he's been pretty banged up, but you've been pretty consistent throughout this entire process that he's not going to be a top 10 pick. Tell me why so many teams are willing to pass up on the greatest tight end in college football history. Yeah, I mean, here's the thing, man. Like, Brock Bowers is awesome. And there is a difference between being high on an overall big board and then a team actually taking you high with one of those picks. And so with Brock Bowers, there's more than just the prospect evaluation part that comes into it. It's very easy to watch this guy. You could turn on the tape any year of the last three years and know that he's phenomenal. But with a tight end specifically, you also have to think about the financial part of it. And if Brock Bowers, let's say, for example, gets drafted in the top 10, Well, rookie contracts are set when it comes to the draft. And so the higher you are picked in the draft, the more money you get paid. But there's a little bit of wiggle room with like certain like signing bonuses and things like that. But for the most part, the contracts are what they are. And that's what the CBA agreed upon. You don't have these crazy contracts like the Sam Bradford contract when he got drafted, where it was like this guy was getting over 50 million guaranteed and he hadn't even played it down yet. Well, they kind of put a stop to that with the later CBAs and they said, okay, we're going to actually set a rookie wage scale. So now it's not about negotiations after you get drafted, where you get drafted is how much money you are going to make over the next four years until you get another deal. So for Bowers, if he were to be picked in the top 10, anywhere in the top 10, he'd basically be a top 10 paid tight end in the NFL immediately because the position doesn't really garner a lot of money. Like some, the top tight ends, of course, like, you know, guys like Travis Kelsey, when Rob Gronkowski was around, you know, like Darren Wallers had a huge deal. Mark Andrews, these guys, like they make serious money, but the gap, or I should say the fall off between those top three, four guys, and then even average tight ends is a lot. So all of a sudden, Brock hasn't even played down in the NFL yet, and you're paying him as if he is top 10 in the position in the league. Now, he might be, right? And that's fine. you you, you got to be okay with that investment. But it's just something to think about because, for example, for an edge rusher, if you draft an edge rusher in the top 10, well, it doesn't matter if they're good or not. Like, that's, that's going to be a steal for top edge rusher money. Of course, the same with quarterbacks. Of course, the same with wide receivers as well, offensive tackles. You just get more of a steal if you nail it at one of those positions and get that whole rookie contract for them, then you would, if you're a tight end, if you you draft Brock Bowers, it's like, okay, I think you're going to be good, but you also better be good because we're already paying you as if you are. So I think that kind of goes into the equation, but then there's also something to think about with Bowers is for as much as I think that he is a pound for pound, like strong player, good all around tight end. This is somebody who, and I'm looking at his combine numbers right now, 23rd percentile for the position at the NFL level in height, 12th percentile for the NFL at at that position in in weight, and then the wingspan, the arm length, the hand size, all of it is below 40th or 50th percentile anyways. So you just have to think about him a little bit differently because if you draft him saying, oh my goodness, this is a five-tool tight end, he could do literally anything, 
I don't think that's going to be the case at the NFL level. It's not like you're going to be able to have him on the line of scrimmage and have him go one-on-one with, with defensive ends. Like he just doesn't have that size. He can get away with it in college, even in a great conference like the SEC. But the NFL, is a little bit different. These guys are bigger, they're faster, they're stronger. And so his measurables are also something that you have to think about. It's not like he is this, again, like built like a Rob Gronkowski type of a player. He's not. So he's more than more of a receiving tight end, and that's okay. That's totally fine. He was dominant at that when he was at Georgia. But these are just the conversations that you have to have that might say that that might lead you from going, man. In terms of tight ends, hard to grade him much much higher from a evaluation standpoint. But where you draft him, that conversation is a little bit different. And some teams will take that more seriously, and others might just go, hey, we love the dude. We're taking him anyways. It doesn't matter. The pay scale is a really good part of it. The, the part that I hate about like the, the entire conversation is, well, Kyle Pitts showed you why you shouldn't take a tight end that high. And it, like that, that's the part where right. I, I get lost in that one. And I, I, all of a sudden I get really frustrated. It's like, as long as you tell me, okay, there is a little bit more of a reason. And I all agree to disagree, like with some of the testing stuff that, that is valued by, by front offices in the way of like, all right, what's this guy looking like at football speed? Look at the guys that he has taken on in the SEC that are defensive linemen and stuff like that, the willingness to block all those different things. But just tell me that Kyle Pitts isn't going to be part of the reason why this guy isn't a top 10 pick. Right. And uh, look, unfortunately, I can't guarantee that for you because <sighs> some some front office people and some owners just sometimes get things in their head and they cannot get it out. And obviously for Pitts, you know, it's funny. It's like, Pitts hadn't been that bad. Like it, it's like we 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 wanted Kyle Pitts to come in and average thirteen hundred yards a season. Like he he's been fine. It really has not been that bad, especially when you look at just the um, I, I would say like lack of consistent identity on the offensive side of the ball. Like they really wanted to run the ball a lot, so they had a very deep rushing rotation. Then you throw in Bijan Robinson in there, and it's like okay, now you've got all these different weapons that you want to go to, but he still has a really deep rushing rotation as well with what Arthur Smith was doing. So it's like, damn, if you put Kyle Pitts in other situations around the NFL, like he's fine. It's not like he, you picked him at four and he busted. It's yeah. not like it's like, oh yeah, see, it was not worth the investment. So that's why I agree with you completely. When we have the Brock Bowers conversation, I always tell people, I think it's a financial one. And I also think it's a measurable one. Cause I think that people have watched Brock Bowers over the years at Georgia and size has never been an issue. So you've never really thought about it. But even when I went back to summer scouting this year, when we started, when I finally was able to evaluate Brock Bowers from an NFL draft perspective, I looked at his bio at Georgia and you know, this a lot of schools, they lie a little bit, right? It's the, it's the old Tinder profile, Bumble profile. If you're five eleven, you're six feet tall. You know, if you're two thirty, maybe you're two forty. you know, you're just bumping it up a little bit, making you look better. And Brock Bowers was listed at 6'4", 240. And I'm like, uh-oh, is he below 6'4", and is he below 240? Because that, like it showed up at the Combine, that makes you light for a tight end. That doesn't make you this all-around, I can play you anywhere, I can play you in line, play in the slot. And he can do a lot of those things. But it is different when you have that size that is much, much smaller than what you are usually used to at the NFL level. So those are the two categories that I think are valid of why Brock Bowers might be more of a number eight overall to number 15 overall guy instead of like a guy who's got to go in the top five because of how good he's been over the last three years. The draft starts at two with what Washington is going to do. It feels like the Drake May, Jaden Daniels discourse is kind of at peak levels right now. Yeah. You have May as that, that number two overall pick. Do you believe May is a better prospect or that this is about just what the commanders are looking for and not so much about like who Jaden Daniels is? And it's more about like this is just kind of the way that they want to run their offense. They don't want to have, you know, a quarterback that's quite as mobile taking those types of hits, maybe a little bit of the RG3 scars that are still probably there for the organization. Yeah, I don't think there's there's the RG3 scars. You know, if it was the old ownership, if it was still the old regime, maybe sure. I think that a little bit. But new ownership, new general manager, new head coach, everything. I, I think that those uh, those feelings, uh, or, or I guess just those you know historical feelings, I should say, aren't there. Although I do obviously see a little bit of the similarities with both Jade Daniels and RG3 being these more slender type of dual threat quarterbacks. So the visual comp is there, but I don't think that's really holding things up. I definitely, if I've got May at two or if anybody has May at two over Jaden Daniels, 
you absolutely have to just think he is a better prospect because there's no doubt about it. If you just look at last year's production, Jaden Daniels blows everybody out of the water. I mean, he was the best quarterback of the bunch in 2023. There's no question about it. But what I like the most about May over Daniels specifically, I think that it's three things. I'll say three things. One, I just think his arm's better. I, I really do. I watch Drake May and I watch that ball rocket off of his wrist. I think that when he comes into the NFL, he has top tier quarterback NFL arm strength and NFL arm talent. Now, is it quite Josh Allen? Is it Anthony Richardson? No, but it doesn't have to be that, you know, it's a little bit, it's a little bit below maybe what Justin Herbert is, but it's still in that category of I'm never going to be worried about Drake May's arm talent, especially when it comes to velocity and ripping it over the middle of the field. That's point two for me. A lot of experience for Drake May over the last two years, throwing over the middle of the field, specifically between 10 to 20 yards between the numbers. That is what you want to be good at and experienced at when it comes to the NFL level, because you've got to force defenses to defend every blade of grass. And for a lot of these offenses in college football, they like throwing to the sideline. They like being outside the number of passing offenses, which is fine. Wins you a lot of good games. And I'm not going to sit here and say that throws to the sideline are easy. They're not. They take a lot of anticipation, a lot of accuracy. They're very important. But for a lot of offenses in the college level, they focus so much outside the numbers. They just don't have their quarterback really looking over the middle often. And I think you just see a lack of experience show up in the timing of how you are reading that part of the field, knowing when to go there, knowing when to attack it when it is weak in a certain type of coverage. And I think that May does that very well. He's had a lot of success in that area over the last two years. And then the final thing is just durability. He's bigger. He's thicker. You know, I, when he talks about like taking those big hits, both of these guys are mobile. Jaden certainly, I think, more of a straight line athlete. He's a better straight line athlete. But J- Jaden's also taking a punishment. And it's like, man, you, we got to get this dude in like baseball score or something. You got to like understand how to slide, man. You got to protect yourself. At least that's what I hope for him because he's a hell of a talent. So when I take those three categories, which is, um, you know, experience over the middle of the field, um, the the durability part of it and then i can't even remember what was the first what was the first point that i just made it was middle of the field it was oh arm talent overall so those are three categories i think that jaden has a adequate arm for the nfl level but i think because jaden has hit so many of these deep shots in lsu's offense the slot fades the go routes to brian thomas jr and to malik neighbors I think his arm is being romanticized a little bit. That's the, that's the word that I keep coming back to because there's a lot of quarterbacks out there who, if you have good mechanics, you can put good, enough trajectory on the ball to get it to where it needs to go deep down the field. But can you really rip it over the middle? Jaden has, to me, the best fundamentals of the top quarterbacks in this class. I mean, from his footwork to his throwing motion, it is beautiful. I think it is picture perfect. And because of that, he's able to maximize his arm talent. But I still think that his arm is just adequate from a velocity standpoint going into the NFL. So Drake, I think is a little bit better in that area. Jaden, like I was mentioning, his offense very predicated off of outside the number throws. Doesn't have that sort of experience over the middle of the field. Not that he can't learn it, certainly not saying that, but some guys it's really tough. So that is a projection for him where I don't have that projection with May. And then ultimately, yeah, I am worried about the durability a little bit because you draft Jaden Daniels to be a dual threat player for you, and he just needs to protect himself a little bit better. So it's those three categories that split these two very, very talented prospects who I think are both going in the top five. Yeah, like it's splitting hairs. I mean, this is somebody that's going to be, you know, given the keys to an offense, one would think he he has all the potential to be a franchise quarterback. And as much as I love Jaden, the one thing I, I find myself asking is there a little bit of the Mac Jones 2020 factor where very different players, but the surroundings are just so good and you worry about what does that look like? And the counterpoint is, well, you've seen guys that have had great surroundings who step into the NFL in less than ideal situations. And look, a CJ Stroud happens and that guy looked like he should have been the number one overall pick. Mm -hmm. So how much of that is a legitimate concern that you look at the Brian Thomas, Malik neighbors, elite offensive line, all of those things and say, Hey, it's great that you figured some things out and you were able to process better than you ever have in your entire career. But how much of that do you think can be a legitimate holdup and could be something that prevents him from being an immediate star in the NFL? Yeah, I think that there are people out there who uh, 
truly like emphasize that point. You know, they cannot get past the offense and particularly the passing weapons that he had to throw to. I would say that that would be more of a concern for me if I didn't know Jaden's path to getting to how good he is now, right? True. Because I remember watching him at Arizona State and he, at Arizona State, he was very clearly a, I am a running quarterback. And then when the defense kind of comes down and, and, and tries to collapse on me for these RPOs or these quarterback draws or just escape plays, scramble plays, whatever, boom, I'm going to hit it over the top. And he was basically like deep shot or I'm running the football. That was basically it when he was at Arizona State. So you saw the talent there, but he just, I mean, he wasn't going through progressions. He wasn't feeling a pocket. He wasn't hanging tough in a pocket. None of that when he was at Arizona State. He transfers from Arizona State with talent, like I said, just not really realized the way that it needed to be, goes over to LSU. That first year at LSU, you could tell his emphasis was, I'm going to protect the football. I'm I, like coaches are harping on turnovers. I want to be a starting quarterback in this league in the SEC. And the quickest way to get yanked from a starting quarterback job is if you turn the ball over. And he made a he and he made an effort to have a low turnover worthy play percentage. And not only did he, it was one of the lowest in the country. So this dude really understood where defenses were trying to attack him and did not put the ball in harm's way. Fast forward to this year. So you go another year forward. He takes the lessons that he had learned and that he had put into practice of being a better decision maker and not putting the ball in harm's way. And he said, okay, but I got to ramp up my aggressiveness. I can't just be somebody who holds on to the ball. I still got to make plays down the field. And so we almost saw just that evolution of him this year. So the, 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 the point of, okay, well, how much is he just like his passing weapons? I mean, I think he helps make his passing weapons as well. You know, Malik right. Neighbors and Brian J Thomas Jr. are incredibly talented players, but I don't think one takes away from the other. I really don't. And, and again, I, I, I might feel differently if I didn't, feel so confidently about Jaden's journey and how he became that quarterback. Maybe I would feel it's a little bit more fool's gold, but I don't. And, and some evaluators out there, I know do hold his receivers against him. Sometimes that is the case. I personally don't see it that way. Let's talk about one of those guys, Malik neighbors who you have him mocked at, at nine to the bears, which I am giddy about thinking just, just thinking about DJ Moore, Keenan Allen and Malik neighbors in the same offense, how interchangeable those guys can be. is just like something I've never had as a 33 year old bears fan in my entire life. So I hope that happens as much as I I'm probably going to be disappointed on draft day, but is neighbors like, is, is he so, is he really in that? Like, I know everybody talks about the tiers with these wide receivers. Marvin Harrison Jr. is like the, the tier one. And then it's kind of pick your poison between Roma Dunes and Malik Neighbors. How would you separate those guys? Is there really much of a gap between Malik Neighbors and Marvin Harrison Jr. for that that top receiver off the board? No, I I, I mean, I don't think that there is. And I've, I've said this before. Uh, we are currently looking at a class that has three players that would be wide receiver one in basically every other draft class. Not all of them. You know, the Jamar Chase draft class was obviously special, and there have been some that have come before that have been incredible with a wide receiver one. But there's a lot of draft classes that I can remember where any of Marvin Harrison Jr., Malik Neighbors, Romo Dunze, easy wide receiver one. And we happen to have all three of them here in one class, and I think they're all three going in the top 10. The, the way that I have it divvied up is uh, I've got Marvin Harrison Jr. at one. But Malik Neighbors' film and scouting grade for me is very close to him. It really is. I think Rome's a little bit further down. And so I'm tempted to say that they're all in the same tier. I think they all could certainly be wide receiver ones at the NFL level. So if that's your definition of a tier, then they are still in that tier. But those two guys, Neighbors and, and Harrison Jr., the skill sets that they have, specifically with just how much of a route running savant Harrison Jr. already is. I, I My comp for him is taller Devontae Adams. And you talk yeah. about a guy who just absolutely obliterates you when the ball is snapped at the line of scrimmage before he really even gets into his route. Marvin Harrison Jr. has the ability to do that. And then my comp for Malik Neighbors is, is another elite wide receiver. And I hate being too hyperbolic, but it's hard to not be with these guys. I look at what Antonio Brown did when he was in his prime and how elite of a separator he was. And there was a specific athletic trait with Antonio Brown that made him truly uncoverable. And that was his ability to change direction 
yet maintain the exact same speed or even get faster as he changed direction. It was just such a rarity that even the best corners in the NFL could barely keep up with. I've watched clips and snaps of Malik neighbors where he is doing the same thing. He is just a unique mover in that regard. And he, I am somebody who wasn't always like this. I used to be a scout that loved the contested catches, man. Go get me an alpha receiver, man. Go up and get the ball, be a bully. You know, like, well, I, I used to love that stuff. And then I got burned real hard by JJ Ortega Whiteside, by Kelvin Harmon, by Hakeem Butler, all those guys. And I go, all right, you know what? Maybe separation's actually a little bit more important, creating an easier throwing window. And uh, when you watch Malik Neighbors run, it's, it's hard to not see a guy who can create a separation window basically at any level of the field and asking him to, to, to run any kind of route. And so when you are that type of a separator, when you have that sort of athletic potential, um, it's just special to think about, about how good you could be and productive you could be in this league. Your former PFF coworker, Mike Renner, friend of the show as well, he had a, a different comp. Uh, well, he compared a different SEC receiver to Antonio Brown. It was Lab McConkie. And that, that I think, <laughs> that made the rounds. And that was one of those that kind of stepped back. Yeah. And you're like, okay, don't, don't think we've seen that a lot. But then you kind of start to think about what they do best. And I think that's the point that he's trying to make. Because Lab's going to be drafted way higher. And that second tier of receivers, whatever you want to call it, that like late first round, early second round, that has, you know, those SEC guys, a Brian Thomas Jr. maybe with Ladd, with Ricky Pearsall, with Xavier Leggett. Mm -hmm. It's loaded, man. Like if I miss out on one of those first three receivers and I'm picking off the board and I got one of those guys that are falling to me, if maybe I'm the Chiefs or something like that, it feels like the market is really, really good. Which one of those guys, I know you just talked yourself off of the, the go get it receiver, the, the bully ball type receiver, but which one of those guys do you think is maybe best built to step in and help a good team immediately? Yeah, I mean, there's there are so many good receivers in this class. I mentioned at the top, it's it's obviously um, very very talented in those top three guys. But you know, we're having conversations right now of what's this draft going to look like? It, it, is this wide receiver class so good that we're going to have a record breaking number of them in the first round, or is it so good and so deep that these teams are going to say, no, 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 let's go after a different position in the first round? We know we can probably get a good receiver in round two or round three. So that's going to be a fascinating development that nobody's going to know until draft weekend rolls around. Uh, Brian Thomas Jr. Is, is in the mix to be my wide receiver four. And that's one of the biggest question marks that we have left for this draft class, kind of who's going to be wide receiver four. I think Brian Thomas Jr. is in that conversation. I think Troy Franklin from Oregon's in that conversation. I think A.D. Mitchell from Texas. So not – well, I was going to say not technically an SEC guy, but technically an SEC guy, you know, yeah. I came from Georgia, obviously Texas coming over so I can talk about him on this show. And then obviously I think that Lab McConkey is in there as well as a different sort of size receiver. Ricky Pearsall's getting close. Xavier Leggett's getting close, but I still think it's probably those four guys that I mentioned right there in that tier two. And then Ricky Pearsall, Xavier Leggett, uh, I love Jermaine Burton from Alabama. I think he's going very underrated in this class. Like they are headlining that tier three of wide receivers. So it really is that group there. I think I lean AD Mitchell as my wide receiver four, but honestly, if you, if we did this podcast tomorrow, I might tell you Brian Thomas. If we did it the next day, I might tell you Troy Franklin. So uh, it's a situation where every team's going to feel a little bit different because a little these guys have a little bit of a different flair to them. But to, to me, it's those four guys that are in the mix for whoever's going to be that fourth receiver off the board. Be honest though, when you heard Leggett's accent, you're like, "That's a riser." That's so, he's moving up on my trap board. So, so I only knew about the accent because my fiance Alyssa Lang is a South Carolina grad, and so I watch a lot of South Carolina football, follow that program very closely, even outside of just scouting. And so, I knew that uh, I knew that Xavier Leggett was a country dude. So yeah. <laughs> I know that when the clips were making the rounds, and everybody's like, "That is not how I expected him to talk." I was like, "Man." I've been told that he just, I mean, he cares about football. He cares about hunting. And I mean, just, that's just kind of dude he is. Might just hire him to do ad reads for us. Be incredible. <laughs> Unbelievable. If uh, the Panthers draft him, they absolutely will. I'm just saying they should. Uh, let's get you out of here on this. I, I always like to, to spin it forward to, to next year. I know you've watched plenty of Carson Beck, uh, you know, already you're, you know, you're a Florida guy. Alyssa, I had a handful of Georgia games last year. Mm -hmm. When you do your way too early mocks for 2025, and I realize some of this stuff is premature, but do you anticipate Carson Beck being one of those top five guys overall, or are you higher on maybe the potential of Jalen Milrow or Jackson Dart or Quinn Ewers? 
Yeah, you know, next year's quarterback class is 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 going to be an interesting one because we're we're currently watching the unraveling, if you will, of the 2021 NFL draft class where it's like, okay, Trevor Lawrence is good, but everyone else is basically being traded for day three picks already. We had five quarterbacks going to the top 15. I think you're also seeing the same thing with the 2022 class as well, right? Desmond Ritter gets traded. Sam Howell gets traded. Matt Corral's not even in the league anymore. Uh, Kenny Pickett gets traded. And so it's like, man, when I hear about next year's class, I think it's a lot of good options. Like I was evaluating Carson Beck, right? He he was he was draft eligible this year, and I think that he would have been a really nice quarterback that probably would have headlined. I gotta think probably that like QB five spot. Like I feel like he would have been the in between between like JJ McCarthy at QB four and Bo Nix or Michael Penix at QB QB uh, QB six. He'd probably be somewhere right in that middle area. But even with that being the case. I think a lot of early mock drafts for him still had him, you know, back end of the first round, early part of the second round. Are you really just going to vault him up into a top five spot just because he's a quarterback? Now, we know that sometimes that's how the league works, but I prefaced it with those other two quarterback classes, 2021 and 2022, to say I wonder if there's a little bit of hesitation with doing that again, with really investing in those quarterbacks again, if you don't 100% believe in them. So to answer your original question, though, I think Beck is right there at the forefront of the conversation. You know, it's him. I think it's Quinn Ewers. Um, I think it's Shador Sanders, right? I think Milrow is certainly in the mix, but there's no doubt about it. That the NFL is going to want to see him more from a traditional passing standpoint. We all know what he could do as a runner. Absolutely electric. We saw that this past year. Another year as a starting quarterback. Let's see you go through the progressions a little bit more. You know, let's see you become a little bit more of a passer because he's got that howitzer of an arm. But it's really maximizing your true dual threat ability. I think taking that next step in those big time throws, limiting those turnover worthy plays specifically that you're going to want to see from him. So he's the wild card in that conversation. But yeah, I think that Beck is is right up there with those guys. However, the league wants to view the quarterbacks. I think Beck will be towards the front of that line as we get into next season. Trevor, you're the best. Great stuff, man. Everybody go check out the three-round mock. It is available on pff.com. We'll do it again soon, man. Appreciate it, brother. Anytime. Well, Jersey contest, it is your turn. Your penultimate jersey that you are Mm -hmm. rocking. Second to last. That's a word that I didn't really use until a couple years ago. Penultimate, kind of having a moment now. I feel like that wasn't said when I was a kid, or at least it was too big of a word for me to understand what it was as a kid. Um, but you, your penultimate jersey is what? Um, my penult. First off, that's uh, a good example of you know the, the podcast, the press box. They talk about words that are used specifically for journalism. That's one of the penultimates. Like you would be like, "Hey, this is my penultimate slice of bread." But when you're describing something, you need that extra, you know. No such thing. thing. Well, we just keep going. We just, <laughs> we keep, just keep going. I'm one guy. I feel it. Yeah. So for me, um, this is an Arsenal jersey, and it's more about the team than the name, right? Um, basically, it was the fact that I had just such an amazing time, um, at Arsenal, and I feel like you know, I told I told the story of that I had to kind of sneak my way into Arsenal Stadium, and there was a moment where. Uh, and I was just discussing this, reflecting with my buddy Brady, who was there with me. There was this moment where I walked out onto uh, kind of the stands and the sun was coming through and, the, and London Calling started playing. London Calling. From, and I was like, oh, my gosh, we pulled this off. You know, we got we got, um, you know, my like my family in and two by two at different gates and everything. So we didn't look like a, ho- a horde of Americans trying to invade. Because when you sit in that supporter section, you got to be legit. I mean, you got to win a raffle. You got to do all this. And you're not allowed to resell tickets. So we were able to, you know, get in there and, and get some tickets. And uh, that was really cool. We were great fans for a day. You know, we were stewards of the game. Um, but that's that's the deal is that, you know, I'm not the biggest soccer guy. I'm becoming one. Um, but it's kind of a win in Rome. You know, win in London. You know, I, as much as it's, you know, that 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 goes, speaks to what you've talked about with traveling where it goes, okay, you know, I'm in another land. I need to respect the customs. I need to be a part of it as opposed to imposing my own will. And I think Americans overall could do better at that. Say, what do you guys play here? here High lie? Okay, let me get in on that. Let me see what that's about. Versus like, oh, they got the college football game. You know what I'm saying? Like, so I think it was cool. That was actually like, I mean, outside of, you know, near and dear Death Valley, probably the best environment I've been in because it was like opening weekend. It was this team that's playing really well, you know, in the Premier League table. And to just be among people and kind of be undercover was uh, just an amazing experience. Do Arsenal fans have a certain type of reputation? 
Um, not that I'm aware of. I don't think they're like at, like the super duper rowdy hooligan fans. Uh, the guys, the, the the families I was around were really really nice and polite, and uh, had to tell them all that I got tickets from a friend. That was the code word of <laughs> stop asking me because I'm American. And so, but they were all there was no no ruckus. They were selling the strangest things. The concessions they had Bovril, if you know what that is. It's like a heated beef pate type vibe uh they had like the biggest cheese dog i've ever had somehow i just crushed i was just so drunk off very nice english beer and it was that i felt that way for about 10 minutes got brought back to life and went back outside and just started uh the chance that i learned on youtube outside sort of screaming <laughs> them at the top of my it was incredible hey adapt or die uh, it definitely applies to when you were on foreign soil and you yep. are in a spot where you're like look I want to just go all in with this. I want to embrace this experience. I'm on the other side of the world. Let me, let me go all in with this and enjoy this in the way that, that locals do. That is why, like, Mm -hmm. if if you go somewhere, you know, like I always say, like eat local, you know, watch sports local, do it, do it the best that you possibly can and just learn something new and, and have a new experience because you never know. Maybe you come back from it thinking, Oh my God, like maybe one day I'll get back there and I'll spend a month there at some point in my life or it'll, it, it can change your life in a different sort of way. Do you wake up Saturday morning and throw on the kit and watch some Premier League? Did I do that right? Um, yeah, I mean that's like I said. I watched a couple of game, games since then. It has. I don't want to be the guy that like spends some time in London and suddenly starts you know talking with a British accent. I think pretty fundamentally, I like to sleep. You know that about me. So I'm not trying to you know per, uh, beat the poser allegations. I was a poser. You know what I'm saying? But I had a great time. Um, but yeah, like I said, I watched a couple of like the bigger matches, but not you know, keeping up with the table, um, but every day, but I know that, you know, we, we got to see the first goal of the season, which is super cool. And yeah. I, I, uh, I have great respect for, for the premier league. A lot of, a lot of similarities as we talked about with George Somerville, a lot of similarities between like the premier league and ICC football, in my opinion, culture wise, it feels like that's the best sort of crossover comp that one can make in terms of level of fanatic and what it means. Mm -hmm. Good fit though. Like it. Very, very nice. Well, we have two more jerseys left after these two more um my last one will be the pod that comes out friday and then yours will be early next week and then eventually we're going to be able to vote on all of these follow the saturday down south podcast uh where we're doing all the voting and stuff that's at the sds pod uh, on twitter lad of the week a lot of choices could have gone in a lot of different directions thought at one point about aaron donald thought about at one point justin fields uh <sighs> I ended up, and obviously NCAA tournament, there's a million. So I, I I went with somebody that has had himself a week unlike any other. Dan Munson, okay. the Long Beach State coach. If you didn't see this story, this this is the type of stuff that it, it feels like the beginning of a weird movie, it, like a weird sports movie or something like that. At this time last week, Munson got his pink slip after 17 years as Long Beach State's basketball coach. Mm-hmm. Guy basically gets told, hey, you lost five straights in the regular season. This isn't really going anywhere. We've been in the NCAA tournament in over 10 years. Uh, coach out the conference tournament. Like, do right by your guys. But you're gone as soon as this ends. Mm-hmm. So naturally, he wins the conference tournament and gets Long Beach State into the NCAA tournament, a place where it hadn't been in 12 years. If that is not a Toby Keith week, I don't yep. know what is. I was just, just thinking that. Yep. My God, can you imagine the the smirk on your face if you looked at the athletic director who fired you after doing that? Here are the keys. Keep it running for me, all right? <laughs> Dana O'Neill wrote a, a great piece on this for The Athletic. It was a really interesting story. Like He's not getting hired back. You, you can't, as an AD, that guy just got you, okay? It's, yeah. it's the Sean Kemp, Chris Gatlin dunk. All you got to do is just dap him up and say, you know what? You got me. I <laughs> better luck next time. Yeah. That, take move on to the next one. But it's it's just a, a crazy story. People forget this this is the same guy who helped establish the foundation for Mark View, Mark View at Gonzaga back in the day, mm-hmm. and back in the late 90s. And then he leaves that job for, after three years to go to Minnesota, which ugh, probably wishes he could have that one back. Um stay mm-hmm. at Gonzaga as long as he possibly can. But don't ever leave cherish it your time in the west coast conference it's beautiful you'll never join a real conference man you're gonna win all these games and people you're gonna do things that are so stupid you can get away with anything sorry that's just mark few with yeah we don't need to get into that but it's just one of those stories that's that's so wild and um even as somebody that has like this this is what marge is all about i have arizona in my final four in my bracket 
if Long Beach State beats Arizona in the first round, I mean, that 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 is just so perfect. That would be unbelievable to watch that yeah. play out. Probably not going to happen, but what a week, man. Fired one day and on to the NCAA tournament a few days later. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, in that um, spirit of that, you know, you talked about uh, Avila. You know, he didn't make it, my, my chunky son. But I can at least take some solace to the fact that my new adopted chunky son – DJ Burns there will go. be there. Yep. And so we did not, it is not saying goodbye. It is saying hello to a new day, a new chunky king. Uh, DJ Burns, well, the two DJs, let's not shortchange the other one. DJ Horn and DJ Burns are kind of the leaders of this NC State team. Uh, DJ Burns, who has had a career that is just all over the place, started um, at Tennessee way back in 2018 19. Uh, and then was at Winthrop and the a Big South Conference, kind of in that same geographical region, and then said, okay, well, you know, I've done enough. Let me move up to NC State. Immediately became, you know, an impact player as a, uh, I mean, this guy's been in college one, two, three, four, five, six years. This is his sixth year. So, yeah, as a senior, his fifth year, right, because <laughs> he redshirted COVID, uh, his fifth year, he was an in, immediately an impact. I just don't want to make it seem like he was this young guy that popped yeah, up at NC exactly. State. But but his first year at NC State, he immediately, you know, found out that he belonged. Uh, and this is exactly, you know, what modern college basketball, if you are to get into it and say, you know, what what can I look for here? If you go up and down like the leading scores on this NC State team, it literally reads senior, senior, junior, senior, 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 junior. And there's like one freshman that's out there doing something, you know, and then, you know, a couple other guys. So point being, you know, this is exactly the type of team you don't want to see in your conference tournament. And obviously they, they won their conference tournament and were one of those bid stealer teams, but you also do not want to see them in March because they are old, they're seasoned gentlemen. You know, this guy is, again, we joke about people being about my age. It's not really that far from the truth with him. You know, he's, been in college six years. So I, I graduated college in 2016 as he was almost starting at Tennessee. You know what I'm saying? So point being, it's cool to see these guys not give up on the dream to say, you know, maybe this isn't over yet for me. And to say, you know, this jer- this name on the back of this jersey and the name in the front of the jersey, you know, both of these guys are transfers, the two DJs, right? Uh, DJ Horn coming from, you know, Illinois State, coming from Arizona State, and then uh, likes the word state. Red, you know, red teams and finding big but, state uh, school guy. Yeah. Yeah. Big state school, not a tech guy, you know, say the word tech around him and he starts growling at you. Yeah. So boy, big, you know, I, I, I want to say that's what we need to start pivoting to is say, let's reward these seniors and when the body of work that they put in and, and not, you know, get as, cause that's, that was pretty fundamentally broken about college basketball that we were just caring about these diaper dandies as uh Dick Vitale used to say. And it's not, it's not about that anymore. It's about these gentlemen who are seasoned that could rent cars, you know, with the exception of bubble teams, because I realize NC State was a bid stealer. You yeah. talk about America's team facing, knocking Duke out. Yep. Uh, maybe, you know, knocking Virginia out as well. Like two of the evil is <laughs> people, people hate watching Virginia. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm not kidding. Like people absolutely hate. I was there for last year, the that uh, opening round loss that they had to Furman. And the yeah. amount of Furman fans that just totally drowned them out and the amount of people just laughing at Virginia after that game. And I, I love Tony Bennett, but people just don't like watching Virginia play basketball because of their style and all that stuff. So like NC State does that, and then they beat you know UNC, the big bad power, uh, yeah. in obviously the ACC championship. It's it's a wild story. It's a great, yeah. great story. And to have somebody like TJ Burns in there, man, it just is, uh, again, looks looks like he could be a movie character. You'd be like, they they – they're trying to tell us like I can play college basketball. Like, yeah, I don't, I don't really know about that. Just the just heavy boy. Yeah. yeah, and like that's the thing. Usually these heavy boys, you know, they gain more. They want to be about six seven, a la Zion, to about six nine. You get them any bigger than that, they start to give you a little bit of the Daniel Orton, right? But you, you, uh, the the big progy back in the day, right? We just knew he had no no NBA future because he was just so uh, heavy. But yeah, to your point, yeah, you beat Duke, you beat Virginia. Beat UNC. Like I said, Virginia is just an assault on your eyes. It's like the movie Bird Box, right? It's like, and I love Trey Murphy. You know, I love Malcolm Brogdon. Like, I'm not taking out what they've produced and, and, and won and championship they won. But at the same time, yeah, Duke is the opposite. They're a very talented team, right? That you get to see all these athletes that are you know, going to be draft picks, but they're just not, I just don't like their fans. It's kind of the opposite. I feel sorry for Virginia fans. <laughs> some, some would say, uh, some would yeah. say Virginia was maybe a missed double dribble call um, from not winning a national championship and maybe Auburn yep. winning that national championship. Poor Auburn, man. Anyway. Yeah. Auburn, raw deal. Raw, raw deal. Bruce, Bruce Pearl could have been another one for 
for lad of the week. And, you yeah. know, I, I resonated with him talking in the post game with Marty Smith about, you know, his dad dying and all that stuff and, and what, what that meant. And Auburn just, Oh gosh, what a brutal draw to have a four seed in the same region as UConn. That's just not right. Going up to yeah. Washington. My goodness gracious. Uh, but yes, NCAA tournament is here. I absolutely cannot wait for it. Like I said earlier, SaturdayDownSouth.com. We have tons and tons of great coverage there uh, as well. Leave us a five-star review. Subscribe to our YouTube channel where you can watch every episode of the Saturday Down South podcast. We are Saturday Down South on YouTube. Follow us on the app formerly known as Twitter, at the SDS Pod, at Set Down South, at CJ O'Gara, at Go So Hard. Thanks, guys. Talk soon.